This is the Change the Map podcast, where we inspire, educate, and resource you to transform the Buddhist world through prayer and action. Join us as we explore the mystical world of Buddhism, discover its unique challenges, meet Buddhist background followers of Jesus, and engage in strategic prayer to change the spiritual map of the Buddhist world. This week, I'm joined by Mark Doreen, a veteran cross-cultural worker and founder of our prayer movement, Change the Map. On today's episode, Mark shares about the spiritual darkness in the Buddhist world. We'll also talk about where it comes from, the challenges it brings, and ultimately how partnering with God through prayer is the key to victory. Welcome to the Change the Map podcast. I'm your host, Josh, and this is a podcast for pastors, leaders, missions directors, and for people that just want to be more involved in the Great Commission. If this is your first time listening to the podcast, go ahead and subscribe. If you're watching this on our YouTube channel, uh, like and subscribe there too, and that'll just ensure that you get all of our content as it comes out. Well, today we're excited to have Mark Doreen back with us. And Mark, today we're going to talk about spiritual darkness. And so we've got a little bit to talk about, and this is going to be a little bit more of a teaching yeah. Correct. We don't yeah. have as many stories, but it would still be interesting. But you're going to give us a little bit of um, what the darkness is like here and why it's dark and how it's dark. And so um, we're just going to jump right in. <laughs> yeah. Spiritual darkness sounds like a <laughs> fun topic, right? Yeah. 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 Well, um, yeah, there's there is real spiritual darkness here. And over the last couple months, you know, we've had a lot of different uh, teams here doing vision trips and we're going in and out of a lot of these different Buddhist temples. And so what's the, what's your purpose behind that? You know, isn't that something Buddhists do? Like, why are we, why are we going in and out of these places? Yeah, actually, if you go to these temples, you'll see big bus loads of, of, uh, Thai people, you know, here in Thailand, Yeah, uh, Thai people going from temple to temple and other countries, other Buddhist from other countries too. Uh, so doing temple tours. So we're doing temple tours yeah, too, yeah, but it yeah. doesn't, it means something a little bit different. Actually, what we're doing is we're, we're trying to get leaders, uh, Christian leaders, uh, especially from what the West, you know, from America and, and, and Christian places, uh, to come and, and uh, experience themselves the spiritual atmosphere here. And, it's, and there's really a very sp- powerful spiritual atmosphere. And so uh, you've been on these trips too with us, and we take uh, groups of Christian leaders, mainly pastors, but other uh, denominational leaders, uh, to the some of the scariest temples, and I say scary in terms of spiritual, uh, uh, tangible presence. Yeah. And man, the this place and uh, the Buddhist world is filled with temples that have powerful, and maybe some of the most powerful spiritual presence. And uh, we we term that spiritual darkness in the world. So, the purpose then, <clears throat> kind of exposing uh, mature Christian. You know, not we wouldn't take anybody to these places, uh, but exposing mature Christian leaders to some of the darker places in the Buddhist world, just to give them an idea that this exists. It's yeah. real. Uh, it's still real today. It's like some people go, some people have said, man, this is just like the Old Testament, these people falling before yeah. idols and this presence of darkness here. Um, and, and so that they'll have a burden to bring this back to their to their congregations, to their people back in in the U.S. and other other places that are that are Christian, and um, pray mm-hmm. and pray, have a burden and pray and send. Yeah, it's a real tangible thing. It's not just oh, this place looks scary or there's something scary in the name. But you know, one of the teams that we had, uh, there were a couple ladies that they they grew up. You know, in Haiti, they were around witch doctors. She, they said, "Man, we've been in spiritual darkness." You know, we grew up in this this kind of stuff, and they were scared to go into the temple. They were almost in tears, saying, "Listen, I do not want to go in there. Please don't make me go in there." You know, and um, they were okay. We went in, and they were fine. And you know, God protected us. But it was their eyes were were open, and they did go back to the states with a, a much um, deeper heart for what people are living under you know these same spirits these same spiritual things this is what these entire nations have been living under for thousands of years and so it's good for people to to experience experience that yeah i've i've had people say to me when they read my book they say are you aware that this sounds kind of weird to our to us you yeah. know f- living in the u.s to read that people believe this stuff but i mean the atmosphere in these nations people 
really do believe in the existence of spirits. I mean, they really actually do believe that. And it's not unusual to see some, uh, you know, spirit controlled person or spirit possessed person yeah. or uh, participate in uh, scary spiritual stuff. The whole country loves ghost movies yeah. and ghost stories. I mean, you look at these uh, every, uh, y- you know, commercials, yeah. all kinds of stuff. It's all, uh, you know, it's a common theme. Yeah. Just the other day, my friend, um, they're relatively new to Thailand. And so they're going through language school. And he said his language teacher was, you know, recommending all of these different movies to him. And as he started to watch some of the trailers and, and try to get into some of them, he said all of them were just these scary ghost story movies, demon possessed movies, you know, just all these like terrible, scary things. And it just goes to show you that it's not like they're just into it, but all this stuff seems like very everyday life. Like these aren't, these aren't, uh, these aren't just crazy concepts that, that are the stuff of movies, but it's like all of the movies, they have some, some of this stuff kind of built in. Yeah. And it's not just crazy people that believe it. I mean, it's sort of a, it's across the board. It's everyone. So yeah, yeah, it's just kind of normal. Yeah. And, uh, and I think, and I think Satan kind of works that way throughout the world. Mm. Uh, in the in the Western world, the supernatural is looked on as suspicious and not very well received, especially by educated people, scientific people. Yeah, and so like you don't see silly. much. But yeah. but here, I mean, people are very educated. They're very technologically savvy. They're uh, they're scientific. Uh, but they still accept this uh, s- supernatural world all yeah. around them. And, and so it's, it's just much more evident here. Yeah, yeah. So when you say spiritual darkness, what does that even mean? <laughs> it's like they cut the lights off. I mean, it doesn't look dark. I mean, what do you mean by spiritual darkness? Yeah, it's a good question because, <clears throat> you know, our Buddhist friends don't necessarily see Buddhism as dark, and it's kind of a really negative uh, negative kind of connotation. Yeah, a lot of stuff is white. You know, yeah. The, the, the <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> well, um, we call it spiritual darkness because Jesus, you know, talked about changing us yeah. from darkness to light. The scriptures does have has several references to darkness to light, and so we see spiritually there is a dark and a light. We see that God is light. Jesus is light. And he's come to bring us out of darkness. So darkness is something mm. that is ruled by the um, by the spiritual realms. I'm reminded of a scripture here from First Peter, chapter two, and verse nine. But your chosen race, the royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Mm. So uh, Paul here is saying that's the thing that God Jesus is came to do. He came to call yeah. us out of spiritual darkness. Spiritual darkness is being separated from God. And uh, and it's ruled by the ruler of darkness, Satan himself. And so uh, basically anything that is not God uh, is, is, you know, any spiritual force or presence that is not God or sent by God, angelic forces, uh, is spiritual darkness uh, defined by Scripture. I I think of another one, too, in Colossians, one of my favorite books. In Colossians 1, see if I can pick this up, 1 and verse 13, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Uh, beloved son. So uh, that's the work of Jesus is to transfer us from darkness to light. And so we use darkness to define that spiritual presence and power that is not Jesus. It is not God. It is not God's angels. It yeah. is um, uh, something that is opposed to God. And so uh, uh, the uh, wor- idols, idol worship, uh, the power that comes with idol worship, the c- power that comes with worshiping any God that is not God uh, is, is spiritual darkness. So um, sometimes uh, the scriptures say, Satan masquerades as a as a as a servant of light. Yeah, and it doesn't feel dark. You know, just like some of the guys that uh, we're going to talk about today, yeah. Yeah. who think they're going to get something good. Yeah, and and they and it feels good for a while, but it turns into a trap. Yeah, and uh, and that's kind of uh, <clears throat> so. Uh, 
to us, it's clear. It's if it's not God. It's not God's angels. It's it's worship of another God that's darkness. So uh, we we're, we term it as spiritual darkness. And this part of the world and Buddhism is filled with that with that spirit. Yeah. So a lot of this spiritual darkness comes from you know the worshiping of idols, anything that's not God. You know, but the Buddha, he didn't really talk about a lot of these, some of these spiritual things. And so where, where is a lot of this spirit worship, a lot of this uh, um, just obsession with, with spirits and ancestors, where does this come from? Yeah, you're right. In fact, Buddha, Buddha himself sort of uh, discouraged the idea of, of following where his background was, was Hinduism. And, and so following this Brahmanistic concept of uh, you know, the one being one with Brahman, uh, and so discouraged, really discouraged the worship of God. He, he in fact, he, he taught, especially in Theravada Buddhism, he taught that only we can help ourselves. You know, that yeah. no one else can help us. There's no God that can really help you. And so, where does all this uh, idol worship and 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 spiritual darkness come from? Uh, one of the mistakes that early Christian missionaries made uh, in modern missions was to talk about what we call high religion, which is to talk about the purpose uh, of your life and sin and heaven and how we need to uh, ask for forgiveness of our sins so we can go to heaven. I mean, that's and that's it. But everywhere in the, especially in the uh, Southern Hemisphere nations, the idol worship is so common. I should say, really, around the world, it's been that way. But, but missionaries going into these places said, uh, those things are superstitions and just put them away. Stop believing in those things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all the different uh, witch doctor type things, the worship of uh, uh, inanimate objects, so we call it animism, mm -hmm. uh, worshiping inanimate objects or animating through, through spirits mm -hmm. inanimate objects. Early missionaries said, just stop it. Yeah. You know, it's superstition. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't yeah. believe in that stuff. You know, yeah. there's no God there. God's in heaven and he'll save you from your sins. And you can when you die, you'll go to heaven. So they preached high religion. Uh, and, and so what happened is many people in these places continued to do those superstitious practices, which we call maybe middle religion. Yeah. And uh, and were syncretistic. So they meaning they mixed the that those religions with Christianity and uh, became not very strong Christians because they're mixing their superstitions. So that was a mistake of early missionaries and we're trying to 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 correct that. Yeah. But um so Buddha made kind of the same mistake. He he talked about the high religion, he talked about how we need no one can help us. We can we only do it ourselves through you know our efforts. He didn't talk about that that day to day superstitious stuff. Yeah, yeah. The high religion is more of the big picture kind of stuff. But most people want to know what, what do we name our kids? When do we plant our crops? You know, exactly. how do we protect against this happening? How do we deal with you know this uh, dispute in our in our town? Like, yeah. there's all what these to, other what things. What to name? That, you know, what to name our kids? Yeah. What, uh, auspicious moment to do this and that and everything. Yeah. Even how to protect our car, motorbike. Yeah. You, you know, there's uh, so many things that 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 daily spiritual involvement uh, and and Buddha didn't really address those things. And so those are things we call uh, animism. Mm -hmm. That is um, calling on spirits that are that are existing in the area to help us. Uh, you know, even all of the uh, spirit houses here in Thailand. You go to. You go anywhere in any town throughout the country, and I would say the majority of homes, even individual family, just little pieces of property, has its own spirit house, a yeah. dollhouse kind of on, on a pedestal, where they believe the owner of that property, the spirit owner of the property, the, the owner of the, the area, uh, lives there, and yeah. they placate that owner. Uh, with daily off uh, daily offerings of meditation that's animism yeah. that's not what buddha taught but what happens is whenever buddha goes buddhism goes into an area uh it uh, takes on buddhism but it keeps the old animistic uh, or spirit beliefs yeah. and in fact seems in some ways 
to magnify yeah. those beliefs. They become more powerful. And everywhere Buddhism exists, there's this accompanying, you know, animistic uh, belief that's very, very spiritually powerful and, and brings uh, as much, uh, you know, more spiritual darkness. So what are some places, I mean, we're, we've been around the Buddhist world, but here in Thailand specifically, um, we have a little bit more experience with those places. You know, what are a few, a few of the, the areas that, that you can see that here in Thailand? And, and what have been some of your experiences of seeing this spiritual darkness where Buddhism is kind of mixed in with animism? Well, first of all, you see it in, in new believers when they, when they come to church. And new believers are often uh, tor tormented by spiritual presence and things once they become Christians. So that's an area that we've had to get kind of used to uh, is, OK, here's a new believer. There's going to be some attack in their life. We need to be ready to pray, to um, cast out demonic powers and spirits in that person. Uh, it's normal. Yeah. Kind of a normal thing that happens. Um, yeah. So um, so we see it, you know, with new believers and expect it. I mean, it's that that's normal. Yeah. Uh, but um, beyond that, you see it everywhere Buddhism exists. And one of the most powerful and maybe the most powerful s of the spiritual darkness kinds of Buddhism is Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, it's called Tantric Buddhism because it, it, it draws on these, these magical, supernatural uh, beliefs yeah. from ba Bon, uh, the previous animistic religious you know, system that existed there before Buddhism came in and took over. And when Buddhism came in and took over, uh, I, I don't know, they were smart or something. They, they knew <laughs> that they had to show their dominance over this past, these past powers. And so where Buddhism exists in Tibet and in other Tibetan Buddhism places like Bhutan. So I, I was able to, to travel to Bhutan two times and visit their most uh, sacred temple, which is called the uh, Tiger's Nest. It's this dramatic temple built on the side of this steep cliff. And the traditional belief system was that a demon lived in a cave right there where that temple now is located. <coughs> and the demon controlled the nation. And so when Buddha, when the, the Buddha that uh, came and brought, uh, or the Buddhist rep representative, Bodhisattva that brought Buddhism into Bhutan and also into other parts of the uh, Tibetan Buddhist world. When he came into Bhutan, he uh, needed to conquer this demonic force in this cave. And so the story is that he transformed himself into this uh, fierce uh, creature and he climbed onto the back of a flying tiger and he, they flew into this, right up to this cave. He defeated the demon in the cave and took control or dominance over that demon that controlled the country. And, and now, as a uh, Buddhist, uh, Buddhism controls the nation. And that uh, temple on the side of the cliff represents the power that Buddhism now has over the previous demonic owners. And the same thing is true with Tibet in the various... Uh, places where the main temples are located. They're located on top of this big dragon demon that used to control the entire country. He was laying down, forming all the mountains there, this huge demonic force. Yeah. So um, uh, it, it, it brings this kind of spiritual power to overcome the previous animistic power that existed there. And that mix creates this very, very powerful spiritual force that is spiritual darkness in these places. So this is a little bit of background. This is why some of these places, when you've been worshiping these, these things for thousands of years, when you believe all of this stuff, I mean, this goes into, gets built into the culture. This isn't just something they just figured out a few years ago. Right, this is something people have been praying, putting their trust in, putting their hope in it's for deep thousands in their of lives. years. Yeah. It's deep in their lives. It's part of their culture. It's yeah. part of their identity. You know, and so to to you know resist Buddhism is to say I'm pulling myself out from under the covering that that rules the demonic forces or the the spiritual forces of my of my country and of my people. Yeah, yeah, very challenging. Hmm. And so I've seen this. You know, I've seen this in Nepal. You've seen it in Bhutan. I've se we've seen it in different countries. Um, but we live here in Thailand, and so we've been to a few 
very spiritually dark places here in Thailand. Why don't you give the listeners just a couple examples of some of the stuff that we've seen here in Thailand? Yeah, and I'm, you know, I'm not wanting to just say this is a, hor- a horrible, big, difficult thing uh, that we can't defeat. You yeah. Know, because Jesus is pre- Jesus prepares us yes, for this. He does. And there is victory in this. But I do want to say that the temples that you and I have uh, led these vision trips to uh, lately. Uh, wished we could have done a lot more, but through COVID, we were not yeah, able to difficult. do that. But uh, they, there's, there's many of them. And one of them starts with a temple that I lived very close to, uh, a couple miles away from in Chiang Mai, uh, a place called Wat Doi Kham. So Doi, Doi Kham is the name of this mountain that this temple is on. And this temple is famous for, not for just its Buddhism, but it's famous for the animistic part, the, the, the spiritual darkness part. Uh, many, many years ago, and this temple is like 1,400 years old. This is an old oh, these are old places. So uh, many years ago, uh, people in this area, Doi Kham, were terrorized by de- demons that would come out of the forest and eat people or kill people. And so they uh, figured out a way to placate the demons. And that is to have one of their local uh, animistic people, witch doctors, get uh, invite these demons to come out of the forest and possess him. Yeah. So that he's, he's now possessed with these demons. And then to offer a cow or a water buffalo for him to kill and eat in this ceremonial kind of way and uh, I mean, in a, in a real way, too. Yeah. And um, and when he eats this flesh and drinks the blood, uh, then he's satisfied and he leaves this witch doctor and goes back into the forest, these demon demonic uh, powers. And then the people are saved. Yeah. They're safe for a year and they do this every year. They still do it to this day. So this isn't a story from like 500 years ago, 200 years ago. This is still happening. It's a story today. from a thousand years ago, <laughs> yeah. but it, it's, it's still, happening. still happening today. Yeah. It's still happening today. Every year there's, yeah. a, there's a festival like this and people by the thousands come and so do the TV cameras. So, I mean, this is not hidden. It's not secret stuff. People know about this. Yeah. And uh, so a, a still today, you can see it, a witch doctor you know, they, they, he goes in there, he invites the spiritual presence to come into him. He kind of goes, his eyes go crazy. He gets a little, little, you know, possessed, obviously. He starts cutting some flesh of, of this water buffalo or cow that, that he's killed or they've just killed. And he starts just gnawing on the flesh and he drinks the yeah, blood. Yeah. I mean, it's obviously a spirit, a demonically possessed person. And then when he's satisfied, and then these crowds of people are watching, Mm -hmm. Uh, the demons go leave him, and he's fine again, and people are happy. Okay, they're saved for another year. And, I mean, lots of people come and see this. Yeah. And accept it and believe it. I mean, these are not uneducated, simple people. These are, you know, everybody in the area. Yeah. And you were there (laughs) recently. Yeah, recently we went, and it it wasn't for this thing but it was for it was at this temple and somebody was repaying a debt that they had made at this temple they said they asked the buddha to to, to bless some thing i don't remember what it was it was a job yeah. some kind of success and when we went up there uh, there were thousands of people because this guy had given millions of dollars worth of flowers back to the temple so those were all dis- on display to make merit to you know, to kind of pay back this debt. So these are mounds like of flowers. Mounds mounds of them. And but mounds but I mean, and it was so crowded we could hardly we get. We up could there. hardly was, move. I mean, thousands of people. And this is somebody who is a successful business business person, business person yeah. that has millions of dollars. Right. It's not just some you know backwoods like right. there's just like this right. mystical you know superstition. Like this is what these guys these right. guys believe. And there's temples like these. Like this, not exactly that story, but all over the nation, all over the Buddhist world. Um, another one that we bring people to here closer to Bangkok is uh, is the uh, what we call the Hell Temple. Uh, and this temple has the biggest of a lot of things, the biggest yeah. cement Buddha, the biggest uh, alms bowl, the biggest, uh, I don't know, they're building the biggest reclining Buddha, the biggest bunch of stuff. 
but it's known for its its hell depiction of hell and so there's like a like a city block square city block of statues that are um, <coughs> depicted in hell going through all kinds of torture <coughs> so there's uh, people who lied and their tongues are getting pulled pulled way out and stretched out and, and being chopped off and there's people get getting their bones crushed and people uh, having to climb <coughs> naked these are people that had had uh, had sexual sins they're yeah. climbing this cactus with being their their bodies are being poked yeah. through uh, there's people being boiled in cauldrons there's people just all kinds of torture and suffering and the whole purpose of this is to is to show people you must follow the eightfold path and obey the five precepts or that's going to happen to you so it's it's Kind You're of gonna spend one of your lifetimes right, you know, working right. all of this stuff off. You get reborn after you die. You'll get reborn into hell. Yeah, and you'll yeah yeah just spend a lifetime working that off. Yeah, uh, and uh, it's it's a fear tactic which is common uh, in 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 spiritual darkness. Fear controls people, and so and there's a bunch of these hell temples yeah. all over. And here's another aspect of that hell temple is you can go to the uh, to one of the buildings where they honor the the guy who started all of this the the temple the abbot the head abbot and he asked that his body after he dies his body just be laid in this glass cubicle laid in state so that people can see him because he he prophesied uh, that if he if that happened that the temple would become famous and so people Again, that's kind of a fear thing. People come from all over, and they look at this guy who's been dead for 40-some years laying in this glass cubicle, and they say, I don't know if it's true or not, but they say they didn't put any formaldehyde or any kind of preservative in the body. It's just a miracle yeah. that he's laying there, and his, he's in, his skin is still, you know, he's still in good, pretty good shape yeah. for being dead for 40-some <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It, then there's... You want me to go on? I mean, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The one more. There's one that we actually um, was one of our prayer points here recently for the big festival that they have oh, every year. Yeah. But, but um, so we're not going to talk about it in this episode. Maybe another episode. But uh, why don't you talk about the Sakyant stuff? Yeah, so Sakyant is a word for the kind of tattoos. It's a spiritual tattoo that uh, a lot of Buddhists get. They believe that these tattoos pr protect people from all kinds of different dangers, whether physical dangers health reasons, uh, relational, uh, financial, you know, they, they protect them, eh, bad dreams and things like that. So people go to this temple and to other temples throughout, throughout this area to get these tattoos put on them for spiritual protection. And uh, basically, uh, the people who apply them are trained by, by monks, but many of them are not monks. They're basically spirit doctors. Yeah who concoct their ink through uh, by using uh, body parts from ancestors uh, and uh, different spirit-led, spirit-guided things so that their ink is, is their own special concoction, their own special spirit concoction. And then they apply these tattoos to the bodies of these people to give them spiritual protection. And uh, what happens is, 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 is some... It sometimes happens. Someone comes to them and they're having these terrible dreams. They're being tortured by demons and they get this big tattoo put on their back or wherever. And, uh, and, and then they're not bothered anymore by demonic powers. But we found out that in a little while, the demonic, uh, the dreams and the fears come back worse than before. And they have to go back for more and more and more. And one of our friends talked to a guy who was tattooed from head to toe. I mean, everything, his face, every part of his body was tattooed. And uh, his story was he had these, uh, he was attacked by demons. He had uh, these terrible demonic dreams and so forth. So he had to get protection. But then they would come back. And so he had to go back for more t tattoos and more tattoos and more tattoos until right now he's putting tattoos on top of tattoos uh, because uh, he can't stand the the attack that that is happening and which is the scheme of the enemy really yeah. it's to enslave you to those things. And every year, outside of getting more tattoos, you can also get these things re I guess recharged. recharged. I mean, is the best way to way to put it is going back to the temple. 
And right. so every year there's a there's a festival there at that temple. Uh, yeah, it's it's called Y Crew. You know, Y means to honor crew your teacher, so honor your teacher day. And so uh, every year, thousands of people who've had tattoos applied in in that temple. And this is the most famous temple in in Thailand for these kind of sakya, these kind of tattoos. Uh, so crowds come, and it's gonna and and it happens like in the spring uh, every year. Thousands of people come and they they honor their their teacher or the person who applied the tattoo, and uh, they get their tattoos recharged spiritually. Um, we had an experience with the head monk yeah. of that temple, who told us. I mean, there was a lot of crazy things that happened <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. that day. We spent like I don't know forty five minutes with this guy yeah. in in his little power room yeah there. and the, the the room gets its power from the previous monk right? yeah that's another temple where the the original uh teacher monk of this uh this temple is lying in state his body is there again 30 some years uh is lying in state so uh one of a, one of the friends who was with us in the room that day noticed these white strings tied around going around the ceiling and then coming down to these two uh, stacks of demon masks on the right and left of this monk because he, he sat there in his big, in his easy big chair, chair with the big like painting behind him. And he was petting a dog. There were dogs in there, too. So a bunch of dogs, look, little dogs. Like a, I don't know, like a, from a movie, like a Bond villain or something, it petting the dog and the big painting of himself behind him. And it was surreal, wasn't yeah. it? But it? But he chatted with us for like 45 minutes. Yeah. So. So one of the guys said, what about those strings hanging down and going over to these demon masks? Yeah. Uh, and he said, oh, yeah. He, he said, uh, the body of the founding monk, my teacher, he said, uh, who's been dead now for 30 some years, uh, is lying in state in another room, another building just right next door. And so we've tied string, <clears throat> this kind of string to his, to his dead body. To his corpse and it comes here and we, we bring it over here to this room and it goes around and and it comes down and so we use it for spiritual power and uh, he said we actually use it on uh, to prepare for Y crew day for that day when all these thousand people come to get their t their tattoos recharged and he said we invite uh, the past monks that are dead uh, to come into the room with us and then we plan he said about about a week we plan for this this special powerful day and um and so i mean it's obviously they're using these demonic powers yeah. to to prepare for this Y crew day thousands of people come and uh, we have film yeah. of i mean these are regular people that you'd see on the street you know and, and at work every day and they kneel down in this huge huge parking lot and a ceremony led by this this head monk and um and putting somehow invoking the spiritual power back into their tattoos and while it's happening numbers of people from the crowd get demon possessed yeah. and they start writhing around and screaming and some get up and run and run around and there's people assigned there's soldiers we saw on, on one of the yeah. uh they're assigned to kind of catch them and control them and to keep them from hurting themselves yeah and and it's it's, it's it, absolutely wild surreal yeah. surreal and and it's accept i mean this kind of spiritual stuff is accepted that's what we call spiritual darkness the atmosphere in these places in these nations that that are buddhist animist mm -hmm. uh are, are are filled with these kinds of scenes and one of the craziest things too about this temple in the sky is that he doesn't have any tattoos and his teacher the guy who founded this temple does not <laughs> have any, crazy? any tattoos i asked him about that um I said, uh, you know, where are your tattoos? Because it's, it's the this guy is singing. like your thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he's got he's recognized as the premier guy in the country for this stuff. Is the one with the most knowledge and power. And he smiles. You know, he goes, "No, I don't have any tattoos." And I said, "Like not even one." He goes, "No, I don't." I said, "Why not? Why you know why don't you have two t tattoos?" And his response was, uh, "It's kind of up 
up to what you believe? And I go, really? I, I said, um, wouldn't a tattoo mm -hmm. help you a little bit, <laughs> yeah. you know, with yeah. power, with prosperity, with protection, you know? And he goes, yeah, just up to what you believe. You know, what I conclude from that is, and, and you said it too, yeah. this guy knows that there's power. Yeah. There is spiritual power in these things, and, and, and he doesn't want it. He doesn't want he it. He doesn't want it. It's like... I don't know. He's <laughs> like a drug dealer who knows the drug is dangerous and doesn't do it himself. He yeah. helps others. That's that's the impression that I got yeah. from this. So, yeah, that's that's he's seen where it takes people, and right. I, I don't. Yeah, right. it's not a place that I I don't think he wants to go. Right. So I know you're excited about going there yourself. <laughs> you're gonna well, be uh, yeah, actually, <laughs> I'll be going next week, and so by the time this airs. Uh, I will have just gotten back, so yeah. I can't ex I can't talk about it now. But maybe we'll we'll throw a little bit in. Uh, we'll have some videos for sure yeah. of this temple. So yeah, get some good ones of this festival. Yeah. So we talked about spiritual darkness and kind of how it's seen and kind of how it's felt in some of these you know power centers, some of these temples and places. But but what does that do uh, to a Buddhist or a person that living in the Buddhist world? What does that do to them spiritually? If even if they're not maybe feeling the darkness, how does that spiritual darkness impact places like Thailand, places like Myanmar, and Bhutan, and Vietnam, and, and all of these places? What what is what does it do to those people spiritually? You know, I think it's a tactic of Satan. Really, um, I, fear is prevalent. Yeah, throughout Buddhism, um, you, I I think of Bhutan, which is calls itself the happiest nation on earth. But when I was there, there's a lot of fear mm -hmm. uh, that and that's the way that's the way Satan works yeah. uh, is when he can display power, the power of spiritual darkness, fear controls people's lives. And so I think that's that's maybe the first thing. The other thing is that eyes and ears are closed to the gospel. Yeah. Uh, when they see these these spiritual things all around them, it makes it very difficult to open to the gospel. And uh, so that's another challenge. And another challenge is that our global workers and Buddhist background believers who live in these places struggle, man. It's hard to, it's a spiritually, uh, you know, difficult place to live. Yeah. So those are a few things that... Um, that uh, that are the effects of spiritual darkness. Yeah, and we've talked about, you know, in some of our other podcasts, some of the other materials and resources, we talk about contextualization, you know, and some of those challenges, the gospel through Buddhist ears, why it's so difficult to communicate the gospel. Mm -hmm. And so that's one side. That's more on the cultural and maybe the mental side, the side of things, the way people think. But this stuff that we're talking about is is more of the spiritual and the emotional side of things. Right. Yeah, 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 and and I mean, pointing out the fact that uh, it's going to take prayer. It yeah. takes prayer. So Jesus didn't leave us powerless yeah. to deal with this stuff. Yeah, uh, Jesus left with uh, us with His Holy Spirit. He equipped us for it. He, yeah. equ he equipped us for spiritual darkness. Yeah. You know, and so it's not an uh, unattainable you know goal, or it's not an unbreakable barrier. Uh, this is simply a barrier that has to be attacked. Through spiritual yeah. means, yeah. you know, uh, Paul writes about it in uh, Ephesians chapter six. I didn't get that one ready. While you're getting that ready, I think it's one of those things that, yeah, with man, this looks impossible. Yeah. This, this mountain looks so high. How could we ever possibly climb this? How could we ever possibly get through this? But, you know, Jesus said, yeah, well, with man, that's impossible. But <laughs> with God, nothing is impossible. And so that's we have God on our side. He wants these people reached way more than, than, than we do. And so, yeah, I think our, our point here is not to say how terrible this is and how difficult and challenging it is. It's just that defining what's, what needs to happen. What is necessary. So some, yeah. some of the barriers to the gospel here we can overcome through, uh, through contextualization and yeah. through presenting the gospel in the right way and through love and compassion, things like that. Other things like, like the spiritual darkness side have to be approached in a different way. Yeah, that's it's not good. impossible at all. You know? Yeah, so, that's good. So, um, so in Ephesians chapter six and verse ten, Paul writes, "Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle 
against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand firm. Stand, therefore, having uh, fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Um, Paul said, it's a spiritual battle. It's not a physical battle. Prepare spiritually. It happens by spiritual prep preparation yeah. and through prayer. And that's why, basically, Change the Map exists. Our primary purpose for existing is saying, this is a spiritual battle. It's going to be won spiritually, and it's going to be, it's going to be won through prayer. Let's pray, and yeah. let's you know, let's let's attack it through through prayer. All right, Mark. So we're running out of time. We could talk all day, like you said, about some of these spiritual darkness things. But the point we want people to to remember is that though it's dark, though this is a challenge, um, prayer is going to be what it takes to to see breakthrough in these countries. So how can we pray? How can we be praying this month? when it comes to spiritual darkness? Okay, well, first of all, let's pray for Buddhist peoples. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they're the ones that are living in the fear. They're the ones that are living with eyes and ears close to the gospel. So pray for Buddhists. Pray for freedom from the fascination with, with darkness. You yeah. know, it's part of their culture and part of their life. Uh, secondly, uh, let's pray for Buddhist background believers, for Christians in these uh, Buddhist nations, for pastors, uh, you know, evangelists, all and all of their ministries, they're living in a very difficult situation atmosphere. So pray for God's protection on them, anointing on all of their outreach and, and ministries. So pray for Buddhist background believers. Thirdly, let's pray for our global workers that are living and working in Buddhist places for physical, emotional, relational, and spiritual protection and covering over their lives. And uh, pray that they will take on that Ephesians 6 armor of God. Yeah. And then uh, thirdly, uh, fourth, fourth, pray for these nations, these yeah. Buddhist nations. Yeah. And, and as I think about it, let's, let's pray in three ways. Let's pray, first of all, for the Tibetan Buddhist nations, yeah. uh, Tibet, uh, Bhutan, Nepal, the northern India, that part of the Buddhist world. Pray for breakthroughs. Yeah. And that's, again, the tantric Buddhism, that, that very, very spiritual, uh, extra spiritual yeah. uh, part of the world. Let's also pray for the Theravada nations where we live here in Thailand and these other Southeast Asian na nations around us. Uh, pray for breakthroughs. Uh, pray for uh, church planting movements to strengthen and increase. And and then finally, let's pray for the Mahayana Buddhist nations. Uh, China and Japan make up our biggest numbers of Buddhists in the world. Pray for breakthroughs there. Pray uh, that God will uh, break down the Jericho walls yeah. that surround, uh, surround this and uh, see some gospel breakthroughs happen. So let's pray for the Buddhist nations. Yeah, yeah. This is going to be a good month for people to really pray, I think, and dig in. And um, hopefully this podcast has encouraged you guys that... Yeah, there, is, there are these challenges, and so we need to pray, um, but this is not difficult for God. And Amen. So, and mm. He wants us to join with Him. And so please be praying this entire month um, for all of these places that true breakthrough would happen spiritually in the Buddhist world. Amen. Mark, it was good to have you again. Why don't you close us in, in prayer? Okay, let's pray for those four things. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that uh, this nothing is hard, nothing is too difficult for you. Yeah. Thank you, Lord, that you have prepared us as uh, your people to reach the entire world regardless of the barriers that exist and regardless of the spiritual darkness. And so, Lord, we do lift up uh, these Buddhist nations, God, or uh, we lift up Buddhists, Lord, who are living in fear, living in spiritual darkness, living in places that are very difficult for them to hear the gospel and to receive it and understand it. Lord, we pray for uh, the breaking of fear in their lives. We pray that they would see uh, the work of the enemy as powerless in comparison to you. And we pray that their eyes and ears would be open to the gospel, that they would become hungry for you, that they would become seekers of you. 
And Lord, secondly, we pray for Christians, for believers who are Buddhist background believers living in very challenging situations, very challenging atmospheres uh, spiritually. Lord, we ask that you would cover them and care for them and protect them. And each of their churches and each of their outreaches, ministries, Lord, bless them, Lord. Give them anointing and strength and wisdom and insight to know how to, to best uh, approach the, the spiritual darkness around them and be effective in ministering the gospel. And then thirdly, we pray, Lord, for global workers uh, who are living in, uh, again, these very challenging places. We pray for your blessing on their family, your protection on their families, your protection emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Cover them, we pray, with your dome of care and protection and use them for your glory. Help them, Lord, to take on the uh, spiritual armor so that they can withstand the uh, attacks of the evil one. And finally, Lord, we pray for the the three main Buddhist areas of the world. First of all, for Tibetan Buddhism in the areas of China and Nepal and Bhutan and northern India. Lord, we ask, O oh God, in Jesus' name, for your intervention in these very yeah. powerful spiritual places. Lord, that your grace would be upon those nations and those areas, that uh, there would be breakthroughs in in different spots throughout those places where you reveal yourself to people and people begin to call on your name. Lord, we pray also for the, te the Theravada places here in Thailand and the surrounding countries in Southeast Asia. Lord, we pray for breakthroughs of the gospel in these places. We thank you for some of the church planning movements that have started. Lord, let those increase and let those continue. And Lord, let your Holy Spirit, Lord, flow through these nations and build your church, we pray. And finally, we pray for the Mahayana areas of China, of Japan, Taiwan, the Koreas. Lord, we pray, God, for breakthroughs in those places where the, where the largest numbers of Buddhists live in the world. God, Lord, let your gospel flow through these places, Lord. Let your salvation, Lord, begin to cover those lands as the waters cover the sea. And we lift them up to you and pray, God, for, for spiritual breakthroughs in these places. And so, Lord, we commit, God, ourselves to you, ourselves to prayer, and this Buddhist world to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Change the Map podcast. For more information, visit www.changethemap.net.